Now, when you are in a situation with a man who is exhibiting narcissistic personality disorders or narcissistic behavior, the best thing to do is to keep your distance as much as possible. Don't engage in the games and don't engage in his ability and his struggle for power. You will not be able to help a man who is exhibiting these types of behaviors by coddling him, by accommodating him. A man learns when consequences are standing in his way, staring him right in the face. Understand that your self-esteem needs to be bulletproof and the only way that it can be bulletproof is if it comes from within and comes from a deep knowing of yourself and a deep trusting and believing and faith in yourself, an unwavering faith in yourself as to who you are and what your value is. All right, folks, welcome back to the Unmanly Podcast. Now, first off, I'm going to have to apologize for the tardiness and the lateness of my posts. I know I haven't posted something to the podcast since like 2022 in October, and that's because I've been on this crazy creative journey trying to figure out the different stuff that I want to do and create. Uh, so if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I'm very active on socials, but I've been very absent from the podcast world. But, you know, the realization lately is that, you know, this is really my bread and butter. This is what I love to do. And uh, it's been calling me back. And I've now given myself a goal of putting out a piece of content on YouTube once a week for a whole year. You guys know me, you know, I love talking about the heavy hitting topics. What I hear a lot lately in my conversations with my friends, especially women, are the toxic relationships that are happening in their life and the toxic behavior that a lot of the men in their life have been exhibiting, especially... Uh, when it comes to narcissism. So narcissism is something that I hear a lot of my friends talk about all the time. I hear this N-word all the time, not that N-word, but this one all the time when it comes to relationships. And I wanted to speak a little bit about it. I'm by no means a psychotherapist, a psychologist or anything. I've never even studied psychology, but I have a lot of friends who are in the industry and I talk to a lot of coaches as well when it comes to relationship coaching and marriage coaching. And I have theories that have you know, bubbled up in my head based on all the research that I've done and my expertise in working with men. And I wanted to maybe set the record straight about what narcissism really is, how it shows up in men, um, what can be done about it. And uh, is there hope, right? Is there hope? A lot of the times, my friends, when they talk to me about narcissism, they mention to me that, uh, you know, their ex or their boyfriend is a lost cause or their man is a lost cause and he will no longer be able to um, you know come back from narcissism or correct his ways uh, and in many circumstances in many cases the men that are you know being discussed in these conversations are actually fathers too so how does someone show up as a father uh, in a, you know you know with narcissistic personality disorder and what can be done so that they can still step up and become um, and and you know, stay good fathers or become good fathers for the first time by definition. My second disclaimer out there is that I'm not here to excuse anybody's toxic behavior, any violence, any abuse. Uh, in fact, I'm here to bring self-awareness to these things to put an end to abuse. Uh, so if there's anything in this episode that triggers you because of the way that I'm talking about narcissism uh, or the way that I think it can be treated or maybe, you know, oversimplifying it, um, please don't take offense and just know that I am here just presenting my idea uh, for discussion. So why don't we start by defining what narcissism is and you know what I found on you know online and, and through some of my research is that uh, narcissism is a personality trait characterized by an inflated sense of self-importance, <clears throat> a need for excessive attention and admiration, and a lack of empathy for others. So it's a combination of the three. And then when we talk about narcissism personality disorder, NPD itself, it is something that's defined as more severe, especially in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that's used by psychotherapists and psychologists to diagnose and medicate folks who are you know, dealing with mental illness. And that is defined as a more severe clinical form of narcissism recognized by the DSM. So it's very vague in how the DSM uh, will define it. My initial thoughts when it comes to this definition is when we're talking about self-importance and we're talking about uh, you know um, attention and admiration I automatically think about the ego so if you've been following my podcast for a little while you'll know that I talk very extensively about the ego and when I see the definition like this I almost at 
draw my attention directly to the ego. So to me, narcissism is related to the ego, maybe the lack of control of the ego, the lack of self-awareness uh, to the ego. And as we continue on, we'll see that it's broken down the narcissistic traits of self-centeredness. So narcissistic individuals have an inflated sense of self-importance and often prioritize their own needs and desires over others. So this is uh, completely clear as to how it shows up in society and in relationships. Okay, so there is your symptom number one. Number two is the need for admiration. So they require constant validation and admiration to maintain their self-esteem. So it's very interesting when they say maintain their self-esteem as if self-esteem is something that needs to be maintained by external forces. Okay, so that's also very interesting. And then a lack of empathy. A hallmark of narcissism is the inability to empathize with others leading to exploitative and manipulative behaviors. So how this is being described is a reactive behavior, okay, due to their inability to empathize with others or how they are uh, reacting to others or their environment. So there's a lot of theories out there as to whether or not NPD or even narcissism really even is a thing or even exists. So I'm going to present the theory here that <clears throat> narcissism is something that is a core correlation, uh, a complete correlation with the ego and also with external factors affecting the self-esteem as opposed to something that is, you know, diagnosable, um, you know, treated with medication, uh, something that you would normally think about, um, you know, something associated with mental illness. So I'm going to be presenting, uh, you know, a lot of my ideas when it comes to narcissism. And, you know, I have myself in past relationships, you know, with my toxic behavior, which is well documented through this podcast, have been identified as a narcissist myself, um, whether or not people believe that or whether or not, you know, anything is different between me and a lot of the men that are being called narcissists these days in your relationships uh, and in your families and your lives. I guess that's to be seen. But it's very interesting because, you know, it's been documented and researched, of course, right? And that's what makes it into the DSM. Now, I'm not here to, you know, argue or, you know, invalidate, you know, the DSM um, or what its use is and what its, you know, real true role is in society. But there is some controversy that exists over the diagnosis and prevalence of it and debates about whether certain traits are over pathologized. So we're going to dive a little bit into that right now and figure out what we can say not concretely or conclusively but what we can dive a little bit deeper into narcissism and see what we can do to help correct it in our lives a very very interesting point here is that research suggests that narcissistic traits might be more prevalent or more readily identified in men as opposed to women due to societal expectations and gender norms. This makes me think, is it really more prevalent in men because of societal norms and, and societal expectations and gender norms? Or is this a result of societal expectations and gender norms? So that's kind of where the basis of my theory comes in. Um, male narcissism often manifests as competitiveness, dominance, and a drive for power and success. So there's nothing new here since the beginning of time. Men have always been competitive with each other, have always, you know, thrived for dominance and for power, driven by power and also driven by success. So, you know, whether or not this is a perfect storm whipped up of the societal expectations mixed with our own innate um you know, desire to be competitive, to be number one, to be the alpha. This is possibly something that's going to be driving my theory going forward in this uh, in this podcast episode. When you are in a relationship with someone who you know is ex is exhibiting narcissistic personality disorders or narcissistic behavior, uh, what are some of the signs for you to realize things like this? Right, there's key signs associated with you know NPD and that is manipulation uh, so if you feel like you're being manipulated in your relationships that's possibly something that's going on you know a lack of accountability gaslighting which is something that's very very new and spoken a lot about you know in today's generation today's society uh, and a tendency to belittle or demean others now Aside from the diagnosis of NPD, uh, when we think about a man who is being manipulative in a relationship, showing a lack of accountability, gaslighting, and a tendency to belittle or demean others, there's really a symptom behind that of ego and of power, right? So since a man thrives and strives for power, when a man feels like he's losing that power or loses grip of that power, he's going to try desperately to be able to get that power anywhere that he can. And usually if you're in a relationship with a man like this, you become the easy target for this. 
Aside from the whole definition of NPD and the diagnosis of NPD, understanding that a man's ego and a man's you know, need for power is extremely fragile and extremely external driven, then we can see that when a man is threatened with this and when a man is threatened to have a lower sense of power or a lower sense of control, that he will begin to act out uh, because he does not have control over himself or control over his emotional regulation to be able to act with a cool head in that position. Now, when you are in a situation with a man who is exhibiting narcissistic personality disorders or narcissistic behavior, the best thing to do is to keep your distance as much as possible. Don't engage in the games and don't engage in his ability and his struggle for power. You're going to need to set extremely powerful and strong boundaries for him to even realize that something is going on, for him to be able to realize that he needs to change. You will not be able to help a man who is exhibiting these types of behaviors by coddling him, um, by accommodating him. A man learns when consequences are standing in his way, staring him right in the face. Also, if you're going through something like this or an abusive relationship, if you feel unsafe, make sure you're seeking out help and support as much as possible make sure your friends know what's going on make sure you're able to reach out to you know your therapist or anyone who's understanding of your situation in case you're in danger of something happening to you now on the flip side now if you are a man who has been labeled or called a narcissist there are some things to think about here obviously your behavior is triggering something in someone else to be able to bring this up to you you may be exhibiting some of the things that we spoke about earlier, such as you know manipulation, lack of accountability. So these are things that you might wanna look into yourself and to see how are you reacting to certain situations. My number one advice for men is to be as self-aware about your ego as much as possible. Now, what does that mean, being self-aware of your ego? That means understanding your thoughts and how they're coming up in your head, slowing down your thoughts, you know, practicing things like meditation to be able to slow those thoughts down as they're coming into your head before they become a reaction. Because I've been in toxic relationships myself where I have been the toxic one. And the thing that I noticed the most about myself is that I was on autopilot. So anytime a thought was coming or anytime I felt triggered or I felt offended by something, my fight or flight activated and I started acting a fool right away. So being able to slow those thoughts down, being able to understand where these thoughts are coming from, how they're coming out, how they're manifesting themselves into the actions that you're doing. This is the way that we become more self-aware of our ego because we cannot change until we know what we're doing. Reflection here is the most important thing. And if you need help getting to that point, speaking to a therapist who is trained in relationships, who is trained in things like empathy, trained in things like attachment theory, will be able to help you have that self-reflection and to be able to hopefully have that growth that you're looking for to become a better partner and most likely a better person for you so that you can have emotional regulation going forward to be able to help you in relationships and all other aspects of your life. Now, another part in understanding where this narcissistic behavior comes up within us is again, going back to the beginning of the video where we talk about cultural norms and gender rules. Understanding what our beliefs are about our own gender rule, uh, about our own societal and cultural norms and the role that we play in society. Now, there's a lot of groups out there, the red pill groups, the incel groups that talk about the role of men and the role of women. Now, when we get caught up with this and we get caught up in our own cultural norms and societal ways that things should be, we get really, really confused because we create an expectation for ourselves. We create an expectation as to how women should behave, how men should behave. And with that, we create how we should behave if a woman doesn't behave the way that we want them to. To me, expectation is the root of all disappointment. So I try as much as possible to try to limit my amount of expectations of how anything really should be. Take things how, how, take things how they come, uh, meet individuals where they are, and try not to cast judgment too quickly. A lot of the times when we're feeling confused about relationships, we go online and we try to find a community and we try to find other guys who echo the same sentiment as us to you know share our frustration because it really sucks to be frustrated, but it sucks even more to be frustrated alone. So we seek these communities of other people who feel the same way as us. Now, this can be very, very dangerous when you're, you know, getting involved with communities of men that are very frustrated, it can be potentially dangerous. 
Um, and it could start with just jokes and memes, um, but you never know how some people can take it seriously and how extreme some people can get with their frustration. So you need to be very, very careful with the communities that you're seeking out when it comes to how you feel about uh, these societal norms and these cultural norms, because you never want to get into a position where you are excusing your own behavior, you are validating your own toxic beliefs and behavior that's going to lead you to either harm yourself or harm other people. Now let's talk about self-esteem here. Self-esteem to us is a feeling, right? So here it says narcissistic men often have fragile self-esteem that depends heavily on external validation. The ego in this context becomes a defensive construct to protect against feelings of inadequacy and vulnerability. Now to me, this is the most important part of this podcast episode. Our self-esteem can often lead us to react and to behave in certain ways for us to protect ourselves, to, to protect how we feel. No one wants to feel low. No one wants to feel like, um, like they're nothing. No one wants to feel like everyone's better than them, right? So you've got to be very, very careful with how sensitive we are with our self-esteem. Now, we've always been told that our value should never be set by someone else. Our value is internal, our value is within. You'll see all the videos and all the podcasts, what I talk about is it's very, very dangerous when we put our validation externally, when we need the validation of others so that we feel good about ourselves. It's so important to build your self-esteem from within, to know exactly who you are, where you stand. Um, and it, again, it has absolutely nothing to do with anything outside or anybody else. But in reality, it doesn't show up like that, does it? Um, when we look at social media, we tend to compare ourselves to other people a lot. We put ourselves up and we compare ourselves to people who, who are within our society and within our culture. And we kind of create a hierarchy, right? Society always wants us to create a hierarchy of, you know, who are the, the betas and who are the alphas, right? Uh, but this is all made up. This is all cultural. This is all put out there um, to confuse us. Understand that your self-esteem needs to be bulletproof. And the only way that it can be bulletproof is if it comes from within and comes from a deep knowing of yourself and a deep trusting and believing and faith in yourself, an unwavering faith in yourself as to who you are and what your value is. Uh, and another thing here, and this is an important point because a lot of men suffer from this, especially in the in the world of men's mental health. We talk about, you know, you know, it's okay to share your feelings. It's going to talk about your feelings. A lot of men have that emotional suppression because they don't feel like it is manly to be able to talk about how they feel. Uh, so if a man is frustrated and a man is not feeling adequate, you know, instead of talking about it and instead of, you know, reaching out to somebody about it and expressing it, you know, truthfully how they're truly feeling, they're more likely to mask it with an over macho, uh, an over machismo kind of reaction. So we have to be able to not be afraid to share how we're feeling and what's going on with ourselves to be able to alleviate this tension that's building up within us that's going to come up in a toxic way. Me, well documented, you know that my approach to men's mental health is I'm less of a, you know, let's hug it out and a kumbaya type of guy and I'm more of a let's look deeply within, let's take accountability ourselves and let's move forward and let's have more of that warrior spirit which I think is missing in today's men, in today's society. But that's all speaking within. Now let's look at relationships here, interpersonal relationships. Uh, in relationships here, it says narcissistic men may seek to dominate and control, reflecting an ego-driven need for power and superiority. Now we've discussed this a few times already. This can lead to unhealthy dynamics and conflict. So when a man feels like he doesn't have a strong footing in society, he's going to want to seek to dominate, to have control, right? So if a man feels like he doesn't have control with his job, he doesn't have control with the men around him, uh, he's going to seek to take control of his household and of the people very, very close to him. And this could get very, very dangerous. So just understanding that this may be happening to your partner, the person that you're with. And if you are the, the you know, the man itself, um, you know, the, the, quote unquote, the labeled narcissistic person yourself, you need to realize that there could be a power dynamic at play within your life. How do you feel about other men in your life? Are you threatened when you see things on social media, you know, with a man with bigger muscles than you, or a man who's getting more women than you, or a man who is richer than you, um, or a man who is smarter or funnier than you? Do these things threaten you about someone else? And if it does threaten you, you need to look deeply as to why that is and what you can do about feeling more secure around how you feel about yourself and how you feel around other men. The more work you do in this regard, the better it is for you in the long run in all of your relationships.
Another very interesting thing that's come out in my research is an empathy deficit. When we talk about an empathy deficit, we can often bring in the conversation of, you know, being a psychopath and being a sociopath as well. And a lot of the women that I've talked to who have talked to me about their relationships often group in the narcissism with the psychopathy and the sociopathy. So I think there's a big difference between all three. And I think the psychopath and the sociopath are more or less likely to be treated because they almost have zero ability to be able to even be empathetic. Whereas the narcissistic behavior often comes from past experiences, early childhood, and you know possibly some mixes of genetic predispositions. But narcissism can be treated through psychotherapy, through CBT, through DBT, uh, through psychodynamic therapy and things of that matter. But the resistance and the challenge in treatment is the resistance to therapy, right? So because men already are dealing with challenges of their own ego, they may feel that it is below them to go to therapy. Um, they may feel an unwillingness to admit that they need help. Uh, to be able to seek therapy out. So some of this resistance to therapy may be causing additional concern with someone who wants to either make the change for themselves or if you're expecting for your partner to go make these changes for themselves as well. Another challenge in treatment that a lot of people encounter is a lack of a therapeutic alliance. So I remember in my own journey when I was recovering from my divorce and I was looking for out, out for therapists and for the very first time, I've never spoken to a therapist before. I never really thought it was a thing. Um, I never really thought, you know, it was something that, you know, people needed. I thought it was for people who are mentally ill, um, especially, you know, growing up in the society and the cultures that I grew up in. Um, but when I first started speaking to some therapists, I had problems mainly with female therapists because I felt like they didn't understand me. I felt like I couldn't open myself up to them and that they would judge me. And a lot of the times as I was speaking to my female friends, even then, I would often hear a lot of these behaviors that they were using to describe their current partners, their toxic partners, that I deep down knew that I was very guilty of myself. So I was, I was very, very careful. Uh, and it wasn't until I found a therapist who was similar enough to me. He was a father, uh, he was married. Um, so he kind of exhibited the person that I wanted to model myself after and I found that was very helpful. And I was able to build that therapeutic alliance with this therapist. And from then, things started to finally turn around for me when I actually felt like someone understood me. So although it may be frustrating at first, although it may be hard to find someone who understands you, whether it's a friend, a family member, or a professional therapist, know that there are people out there who can build that connection with you and that you have to be open to building that connection with them. It takes two to build that therapeutic alliance. Um, so, you know, a lot of guys, they may you know, be frustrated with that as, as to how long that takes. It could be several sessions and we know sessions of therapy are not cheap, especially in today's day and age. But having that commitment and having that patience towards that goal that you have for yourself is extremely, extremely important. So just to close, I said a lot in this, in this uh, episode and I hope some of it landed with you. I hope some of it brings hope to you or to your partner. Uh, or to your relationship as to what can be done to help correct some of these behaviors for a better future for yourself and for the person, uh, for your relationships and for everyone around you. Because I really, really deeply believe that when we raise our level of self-awareness um, and when we're able to reflect within ourselves uh, and to be able to take that without running away, to be able to face ourselves truly without you know avoidance or denial, that's when we really start to find change in our life. Being able to cultivate empathy as well, learning how to actively listen a little bit better, to put yourself into someone else's shoe, into how they see you, wanting change for yourself, wanting a better future for yourself, truly, truly comes from within and really starts from self-awareness. And then also being aware of that, that ego too, right? What does ego mean to you? How is it showing up in your life? How is it controlling your life? Uh, learning how to foster that healthy ego uh, how to build your self-esteem, build how you feel about yourself. These are things that are gonna help you emotionally regulate, uh, which is extremely important in your life and how you face certain situations in your life outside of relationships too. How you face significant challenges in your life, how to build resiliency. These are all extremely important and they all start again with the self-awareness and the realization and the treatment of the ego. So again, I, I hope 
some of this resonated with you and I hope that the theory that I have about narcissism and the hope that I have about, you know, whether yourself who is exhibiting these behaviors in your life or your partner who's exhibiting these behaviors, just know that there is hope as long as you're willing to look within and to resolve the inner issues that you have when it comes to how you feel about yourself, how you feel about men in society, how you feel about women in society, how you feel about the men in your life, how do you feel about the men who have been threatening you, how do you feel about the women in your life, how do you feel about the women who you think are in your league and are outside of your league, how they should and shouldn't be behaving, all of these things you need to deal with in your head and resolve and know that it starts with you, okay? So take that time, you know, journal if you have to, speak to a professional if you have to, tell your friends, get used to talking about it. There's no shame in talking about it and make sure that eventually you do what's best for yourself, for those around you, your family, your relationship, and everything else that you've got going on in your life. Because as men, we have responsibility, we have accountability to help make this world a better place, to leave it better than we found it, and to foster better leadership, and to be there and just to build an amazing world for our children to live in, to thrive in, to grow in. This is the only way that we're gonna save the world. This is the only, only way that we're gonna reach world peace, and this is the only way that we should be showing up as men. Let's continue the conversation. If any of this resonated with you, if there's any other questions that you have around narcissistic behavior or anything else that you would like me to talk about, drop it in the comments below. I'll be sure to get back to you. And your feedback is good, no matter if it's good or no matter if it's bad. I just love when I know that you guys are listening because it gives me the motivation to continue doing this. So consider supporting by liking the channel, subscribing to the channel, and I'll see you guys in the next one.